I think William Blake must have felt quite ambivalent about Christmas and the Christmas season. He had mixed views because on the one hand he realised that it was the great Christian feast of divine vision that told the story of a birth from another order of reality and of the appearance in history on earth in time of the eternal Jesus the imagination as he often puts it and the awakening to the meeting of the human and the divine the capacity that we have to see with the eyes of perception that can taste the infinite and realize that all of creation is one in the creator that the seeming division of the body and the senses is actually a reflection of an immense world of delight within which we live and move and have our being but at the same time he lived in a period when the story hadn't become so much sentimentalized and commercialized as it has now but had nonetheless become a trap that excluded the divine vision of which it spoke the trap was of the story being retold as one of a distant god who descends from on high bringing consolation but also imposing moral imperatives upon humanity with the effect of actually controlling access to the divine via the excluding doctrines and constraining hierarchies of the church which is different now but still has that feel of a vast distance being bridged by the birth of this child and a faith in which the great sign of faithfulness is to a set of moral teachings manifest in an even more material world than in Blake's time so he felt that the real message of Christmas was as much obscured by the way it was commemorated and yet it's always possible in Blake to see the light regardless of the darkness often detected best by using what he called the infernal method of melting the surfaces away the seeming celebration of the story to leave the true vision exposed and thereby cleanse the doors of perception to reveal the infinite and one place where he uses this method to retell subtly the Christmas story is in his illustrations to Milton's nativity ode on the morning of Christ's nativity Blake recognised that Milton had spiritual vision but that it had become obscured by his moral puritanism and by the sense of a divine distance from humanity. So it's worth reflecting upon these images to see what they can melt away and reveal of the truth of Christmas as Blake actually saw it. The first plate shows a seemingly traditional nativity scene mary and joseph and the baby in the manger with the oxen standing by and they're in what looks like a stable with a correlated roof and an angel descending from the heavens seemingly embracing the scene it seems straightforward enough but then you look further and you start to ask questions. Start with the angel. Is it descending or is it falling? It looks twisted and upside down, out of control rather than bringing grace. And 
then you look at the building again and you realize that it confines as much as houses joseph has to stoop and the roof looks very thick as much like a prison wall as protection against the elements and this image of the stable is actually in the whole sequence of the illustrations there are six in all and as it reappears it becomes clear that it's not a stable as is the traditional story but actually is just the opening into a church that becomes increasingly vast and so Blake is beginning to suggest that this scene has been caught by the church and turned into something very different from what was originally intended. You see that when you look again at Mary and Joseph, you know, they don't look awake. They don't look as if they're arising. And then you see there's a figure as well in the foreground before this building and it's lying prone. Maybe it's nature. It seems very connected to the ground, but it looks as if it's watching a dream, not a revelation of blazing reality as if this story has somehow become obscure. And this whole sense that something is not right is emphasised when you realise, as some scholars have pointed out, that the predominant shape in the image of an angle, which is made by both the angel's wings and the shape of the roof, directly mirrors the compasses in one of Blake's best-known images, the Ancient of Days. This image of an old blind deity reaching out of an orb and clouds with a great compass in its hand that Blake felt similarly mixed about. On the one hand, it is a demiurgic, semi-divine image of a god creating something but with its compasses it's limiting and measuring it's binding the infinite in the finite and so he felt very mixed about this common portrayal of the distant god reaching down and reflect that in the shape of the angel's wings and the angle of the roof it matches the compasses borne by the ancient of days and so suggests that this image of the nativity is similarly one that constrains and traps, not releases and awakens. The, the comparison can be drawn with a book that Blake was working on at the same time, Europe, A Prophecy. And that begins with Jesus being born, but immediately being forgotten. And instead, the bulk of the poem and the imagery pays attention to Blake's prophetic characters of Los, Enitharmon and Orc. Los, the kind of father figure, Enitharmon, the emanation being the maternal figure, and Orc, their child. And the action of the poem tells of how Los, who is this inspiring but at the same time tragic, creator figure in Blake's works who at once works to build Golganusa but is always at every step thwarted by the institutions and the powers that be around him. Any Tharmon, his emanation in the poem, tries to seize the opportunity of the moment too but really brings about and fosters only warfare and fire and blood in the story. And Orc, their child, who's this spirit of revolution, similarly is at once admirable for wanting to revolt, to overturn. But Blake knew from his times that revolution only leads to warfare and bloodshed and flame too. And so in the illustrations to the Nativity, you notice that the child, seemingly Jesus actually looks a bit like the orc child too. It's blazing. And so there's this sense that what is being portrayed is actually somehow doomed already. It's not a revelation that is 
ultimately going to transform. So we move to the second image, and this is quite a contrast in the series. It's called The Annunciation to the Shepherds. It speaks to a different part of Milton's ode. And I think this is one in which Blake gives us the contrast of a revelation. Immediately we see life and light that seems the opposite of constrained. It's released in a wonderful globe, an orb of angels in the upper part of the picture, radiating light over the shepherds who are quite strikingly sat away from buildings, away from the nativity scene. Um, there are angular pyramid shaped buildings on the horizon distant from them that echo the compass of the ancient of days but they seem free and released in the open air from that and so can see the image of the angels can perceive the taste of infinity that they bring you might say that they're the innocent shepherds in the sense they're outside of rational society though with a full experience of life and death and so can see the divine in all things. Blake writes of the secret child descended through the orient gates of the eternal day. And those blazing gates of the eternal day are shown by the angels in this image. They see the celestial light, like the sun. They've cleansed the doors of perception. They have imagination, so are ready to receive Jesus, the imagination, to see the vision. And that has very little to do with the stable, as the traditional story is told, which now has disappeared almost from view, falling over the horizon. It's as if Blake is telling us in the second image what Christmas really can begin to mean. But he doesn't leave it there. He wants to enlarge, I think, on what gets lost when the vision of the shepherds is lost. And so the next three images in the sequence, the old dragon, the overthrow of Apollo and the pagan gods, and the flight of Moloch, deepen the sense of what gets lost by the trapped perception of the Christian story, of the Christmas story. In the third, the old dragon, we see beasts and snakes under the ground, rising up, taking on life, clutching their daggers and their swords as they writhe to reach up into the air, which is portrayed by the snake's tail wrapping around into the Milky Way in the sky. And that has enveloped the stable scene now, which seems small and relatively inconsequential in comparison. The finite is all that these beasts and dragons can see as they rise. Um, it's the earthly powers, you might say, responding to a limited version of the Christmas story. As, as if orc and loss have lost already and the beasts of power and dogma are the winners. The old dragon stirs, it surrounds the Christ child with its snake star tail, binding the infinite in a closed, finite vision. As Blake writes, the fiery king who sought his ancient temple serpent friend, thought change the infinite to a serpent, that which pitieth to a devouring fire, and man fled from its face and hid in forests of night. These are the demons of futurity as Blake described it, with the snake's tail becoming clouds of war. It's the fear of a pandemic to cut to the present time. And so a church that can only offer the thought, follow the science, and doesn't have any wider vision with which to address this time when people are frightened of death and of being overcome. It's necessary to follow the science, but it's not nearly enough as we're seeing in this Christmas. And the upshot is a neutralization of the human divine vocation. It gets lost. Man became an angel, Blake writes, by which he means falling into servitude. Heaven, a mighty circle turning. It's the machine vision of reality, not the divine life. And so God 
is seen as a tyrant crowned, an oppressive force, a distant force, one that leaves you untended. It moves into the fourth image, the overthrow of Apollo and the pagan gods. And here I think Blake shows a different take on this terrible predicament. Um, it shows the god Apollo standing on a plinth with his worshippers bowing down before him, offering the flames. It also shows another worshipper trapped in a seeming cave to the side. And in the distance can be seen the stone buildings of the Druids. Um, the Druids were not good guys in William Blake. They were the builders of heavy dogma and the requirers of sacrifice and blood. And in the air, their gods are unleashed in a wild, dark image of the night. God, Apollo, shown on the plinth, should be the god of light and of the sun and is being overthrown in this image. Um, he can't fire his arrows of desire and is said and instead looks stuck and ossified indeed in marble form. And so we see here, I think, what happens when passion, when light, when the love of beauty and truth is trapped by the dogmas, by the finite vision, by the sense that God is distant from us. And so these devotees to Apollo get no answer for all their worship and all that they bring. And they're trapped in caves of fear, which I guess is the inner experience of many people now, even as they hope to turn to Christmas for light. The vision continues in the fifth plate, the fight of Moloch. And here is another image of a kind of narrow religiosity in thrall to this world, not understanding life and death. It shows Moloch, who's an Old Testament figure, a king much associated with child sacrifice and was an enemy of Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible. But the worshippers of Moloch don't realise of his darkness. They raise their tambourines in the air, they dance, and they offer, it seems, the child, looking a lot like Orc, looking a lot like Jesus, into the flames that dance around Moloch's feet. And there's lament in the foreground of the picture at the sacrifice, but a seeming inevitability about it too, because the people don't see in their ecstasy. They got a false vision. And what they don't see particularly is that actually the spectre of Moloch is fleeing from the king-like figure on the stone throne, flying into the darkness. He's been expelled. That's the tragedy of this image. When Christianity is reduced to what Blake called the wastes of the moral law, as if faithfulness is faithfulness to a moral code given by Christianity, much like the faithful citizens of the king who just obey the laws issued from the kingly throne. It's admirable in one moment and then you realise it's death dealing in another. For all the pageant, for all the seeming worship, it doesn't release people but just requires sacrifice and flame once more. And the people don't see that the truth is the spectre, the shadow of this worldliness, the shadow that's fear, the shadow that's the finite vision, has been expelled, is fleeing at the appearance of the child, in fact. The people don't realise that and so feel stuck and stay trapped in their lament. And so Blake ends the sequence with the sixth image, sometimes called the Night of Peace. And again, much like the first, it seems to be one of tranquility and calmness, but its colours are dark. That angled roof is even thicker than it was before, now guarded by angels who have to carry weapons in order to 
keep any light out. And the angel in the sky above the stable that's in the foreground now carries a light but doesn't seem much enlivened by it. The horses of its chariot seemingly are asleep and the angel's not quite sure where to look. And similarly, Mary, Joseph and the child are asleep. It looks at a first glance like a sleep of peace, but actually when you look again, is a sleep of blindness and not going, not knowing what's going on. This night of peace is actually a religiosity of constraint and order, which falls from its vitality because of being policed and enforced. It's an illusory peace, a sleep without vision, not an awakening to the infinite. Everything becomes dormant, and even the, de the decorations and the angelic presences seem like barriers and walls, not like transparent portals that can be doors towards the infinite. Orcs, energy is lost. Jesus, the imagination, is not born in this image, which shows the summary of Blake's critique of Christmas as it was becoming in his time and as it so easily can become and be in our time. So the last plate in the sequence echoes the first, but with a deeper sense of what's going on in it because of what we've seen in between. But of course, also raises the question of who Jesus was to Blake. So let's return to that. And one place where you get a clear sense of it is in his fragmentary poem, The Everlasting Gospel. And that's interesting in relation to Christmas because there's a number of reflections upon the early life of Jesus in The Everlasting Gospel. For example, he's clearly against the image of a gentle Jesus or a humble Jesus. Um, his favourite story from the early part of Jesus's life seems to have been the story of when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple when he was in his early youth years and lost him for the three days and then found him talking to the elders of the temple, impressing them with his wisdom. And Blake writes about it in this way. He says, was Jesus gentle or did he give any marks of gentility? When 12 years old, he ran away and left his parents in dismay. When, after three days sorrow found, loud as Sinai's triumph sound, no earthly parents, I confess, my heavenly father's business, ye understand not what I say, and angry force me to obey. So that's Blake's account of Jesus resisting that childlike Jesus, gentle, humble, mild, obedient, pursuing another agenda, even at the risk of his parents' dismay and sorrow. Another way in which he resists this image is in relation to talking about Jesus's parents, and in particular the Virgin, um, about which Blake is very, very ambivalent. He no doubt understands the theology of that, but resists the moral implications that somehow Christianity is about taking on sin or impurity or enforcing morality. He much prefers the sense of Christianity as simply forgiving whatever gets in the way of us and the divine vision and recognising the divine image in everybody, awakening to immortality, awakening, as he puts it, to being in Christ's bosom and he in your bosom. He says that Jesus doesn't take on sin, but simply reveals life and all its passion. So he remarks in relation to Mary, was Jesus born of a virgin pure, with narrow soul and looks demure? If he intended to take on sin, the mother should an harlot been, just as a one as Magdalene. So what he's saying there is if the Christian gospel was really about taking on sin, then Jesus 
should have been born into sin, not this sideways step that the doctrine of the Virgin Mary captures. Um, but what is the truth of it is that Jesus was born so that the divine image can be seen in all, through all, regardless of who they might otherwise be taken to be. He's partly against the traditional account of these things too because he feels it hands over power to dogmas, to priests, to fear really. Again, some sense of distance opens up between the human and the divine which is completely artificial, it confines, it controls. Um, so again, an early reflection of his on the early life of Jesus um, in the everlasting gospel goes like this. It says, obey your parents. What says he? Woman, what have I to do with thee? No earthly parents, I confess. I'm doing my father's business. He's rejecting anything that separates him from the divine, even parental duty. And of course, it's also not about moral duty either, about moral virtue, um, which he argues just brings in judgment and so closes the gates of paradise seemingly to people. So in another part of the everlasting gospel, he says, if moral virtue was Christianity, Christ's pretensions were all vanity. The moral Christian is the cause of the unbeliever and his laws. For what is antichrist but those who against sinners heaven close? You can hardly get stronger than that. The wastes of the moral law, as he puts it, when Christianity is collapsed in that way, rather than liberating, opening to the gates of paradise. The positive vision is put in Blake's great poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, where Jesus directly speaks. And at the beginning of the poem, Jesus calls to Albion, who's about to fall asleep, a bit like Joseph in the images. Jesus calls and says, awake, awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows, wake, expand. I am in you and you in me, mutual in love divine. I am not a God afar off. I am a brother and friend within your bosoms I reside and you reside in me lo we are one forgiving all evil not seeking recompense ye are my members O ye sleepers of Beulah land of shades he's calling us from that slumber which were depicted in the images of the nativity the sleepers of Beulah the land of shades and saying, I am in you, you in me, mutual in love divine. I'm not a God afar off like the ancients of days. I am a brother and a friend. That's what Jesus teaches. That's what Jesus shows. And at the end of the poem, Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, Jesus appears again as the good shepherd, appearing to the lost sheep. So recalling the image of the angels in the great ball of light and fire appearing to the shepherds with the image of the stable in the way off distance. Jesus appears as the good shepherds, having embraced death to reveal eternal life, and says, unless I die, thou canst not live, but if I die, I shall arise again, and thou with me. This is friendship and brotherhood. Without it, man is not. So I think this is a vision of Jesus embracing the whole of the human condition, including death, to show that God is in the whole of the human condition, including death, and so overcoming death. It's the vision of even eternity, not of Beulah, that can see all things from the perspective of God. Wouldst thou love one who never died? Jesus continues in the poem. For thee and ever die for one who had not died for thee. And if God dieth not for man, and giveth not himself eternally for man, man could not exist. We wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for the truth that the divine is within us, rushing through us, embracing all of life. For man is love, Blake continues, as God is love. Every kindness to another is a little death in the divine image, nor can man exist but by brotherhood. So this is death not just as the final death, 
the end of the mortal life, but is the constant giving in the little kindnesses that also are receiving in the little kindnesses. To know that is to know the pulse of the divine life. And then when Jesus speaks this vision to Albion, Albion awakes. This is, if you like, Albion's Christmas moment. So Albion spoke and threw himself into the furnaces of affliction, into all that life brings. And all was a vision, all a dream, the poem continues. The furnaces became fountains of living waters flowing from the humanity divine. And all the citizens of Albion rose from their slumbers. This is the opposite image of the closed stable pressed in by a heavy wolf, a heavy um, roof and with the angels compass wings enclosing and defending all. No, this is fourfold vision which understands life and death, heaven and earth, that God is not just with us, but is actually our very being. This is Blake's full vision of the Christmas story that it can unleash, reveal, help us perceive it's the version of the gospel phrase of Jesus that the kingdom of God is within you. That's what this time of year might awaken within us. So Blake continues in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. So spake the vision of Albion and in him so spake in my hearing the universal father. Blake saying this is what he has heard from God. So spake in my hearing the universal father. Then Albion stretched his hand into infinitude and took his bow, unlike Apollo, who wasn't able to take his bow and fire his arrows of desire. Fourfold the vision for bright beaming Eurozen, laid his hand on the south and took a breathing bow of carved gold. Luva, or love, his hand stretched to the east and bore a silver bow, bright shining. Farmas, or instinct, westward, a bow of brass, pure flaming, richly wrought. Orthona, which is imagination, creation. Northward, in thick storms, a bow of iron, terrible thundering. And the bow is a male and female of the quiver of the arrows of love are the children of this bow. A bow of mercy and loving kindness, laying open the hidden heart in wars of mutual benevolence, wars of love. This is Blake declaring how the doors of perception can be cleansed, infinity can be seen, the divine could be known as with us, within us, part of us, our calling and our future. And let me give the last words to Blake from his notebook, published now as A Vision of the Last Judgment, where he writes about how the modern church crucifies Christ with the head downwards, not seeing this vision, which, as he writes, this world of imagination in the world of eternity. It is the divine bosom into which we shall all go after the death of the vegetative body. This world of imagination is infinite and eternal, whereas the world of generation or vegetation is finite and temporal. There exist in that eternal world the permanent realities of everything which we see reflected in this vegetable glass of nature. All things are comprehended in their eternal forms, in the divine body of the Saviour, the true vine of eternity, the human imagination, who appeared to me as coming to judgment among his saints and throwing off the temporal, that the eternal might be established. Men are admitted into heaven, Blake continues, not because they have curbed and governed their passions or have no passions, but because they have cultivated their understandings. The treasures of heaven are not, are not negations of passion, but realities of intellect from which all the passions emanate uncurled in their eternal glory. This is to have had the surfaces burnt away by the infernal method of Blake's poetry and pictures and to see the true image of Christ arising.